Hello, welcome. Anthem by Ayn Rand. A very interesting little little novel. Um, what did you guys think? Did you have you read it? Did you, did you like this one? Yes, I liked it. It was actually the very first Ayn Rand book that um, that I read, and I, I was really, I really um, sort of it clicked why everybody gets so sort of excited <laughs> um, about some of the her work. I, I mean, I, I at least I felt excited. Um, what, what was your what was the excitement for you? Um, I guess I liked the style that the way she wrote that book, um, like it had like the, the main character, he's he had a lot of strength, but it wasn't, but he was like awakening. And I guess I liked the way she just, the way she, the inner, his inner dialogue or his inner monologue, like it was strong, but still sort of grasping for, the right way to express himself. Right, right. Yeah, I thought it was um, the uh, the the way that his um, sort of enlightenment comes about was really well done. I thought. I, I mean, I, I I enjoyed this book a lot, and the the, um, the the sort of transition from him being a kind of completely propagandized you know, robot to, to having more individuality as the, as the novel goes on, I thought was, was like a great metaphor for like many, many things, um, to do with, you know, finding one's own, um, individuality away from, from all of the propaganda as well, you know, that we have. Um, I thought it was really well written and, um, and uh, I like the, I mean, I thought it was also a really imaginative idea and the idea that, you know, it's uh, progress and enlightenment and um, reason and rationality aren't necessarily forever. You know, it could well be that um, that we get to a stage where there's another dark age. And I thought that was a really interesting idea to explore and to think of our... Um, our time as being a time after a dark age too. Cause obviously, you know, there was, um, with Christianity, um, uh, there was a kind of collapse of a lot of previous knowledge that, 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 um, that people had had. And in this, in this book, you know, it's like after a time when there's been another collapse, I thought that was really, it got me thinking a lot about how, you know, it, it's, um, it's not necessarily, I mean, I was raised by, by communists and, and, you know, I was given a view of history that it sort of marches onwards to progress. And it, it's, it's a really interesting thing in this book to read this sort of idea of life after, you know, another dark age. You know what I mean? Sort of the, the possibility of there being a, uh, another regression rather than a steady um, increase of... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, if we, if, um, if sort of collectivism um, really takes hold and the state continues to to grow and so forth, then it, it's not necessarily assured that that things wouldn't just implode on themselves in the way that they did with the rise of Christianity, in the way that you know so much human knowledge was lost, and so many books were burned, and uh, like so so much was forgotten for a long time. And I think it's, you know, it's kind of a sobering thought to think that, yeah, actually, um, ideas do really matter because um, ultimately um, it, it, could, it could be the case that, um, that if we don't kind of get the right ideas out, then actually the wrong ideas could, could uh, stifle, um, stifle progress and, and lead to a, a, a regression. Right. That's an interesting idea. I'm noticing as, a, as you're talking, like I'm also thinking about the, um, the psycho, psycho history, psycho class theory, which I think takes a more, um, a, a view that's sort of similar to the one that you started contrasting it, contrasting the Anne Rand book with, which is that there has been a steady increase of the quality of parenting over time 
and I'm just wondering how that reconciles. And I, I kind of, I, I kind of accept that sort of view. And I'm just wondering if that's incompatible with the idea that you're proposing, which is that we could actually regress to uh, a more uh, like a new dark age, or not. Well, I guess in my mind it would be, I mean, I think there has been an increase in, in the quality of parenting and there has been an increase in in reason and rationality. I mean, you know, obviously we now have a much better handle on reality than people, you know, three centuries ago did and a hugely better handle on reality than people 10 centuries ago did because those guys were just nuts. I mean, they were just insane. Um but but still, I mean, like, say, for example, statism continues to grow and there are significant wars and those wars lead to the kind of disruptions in in family life and uh, and so forth. That, yeah, I mean, it's possible for parenting to go downhill again. You know what I mean? To actually get worse. And um, and for, you know, I, I don't necessarily I'm not saying like this is going to happen or anything. All I'm saying is that. It isn't necessarily the case that um, that that uh, reason will continue to grow and triumph over irrationality. I think it's possible um, that that reason could be uh, have its ass kicked by by mysticism and and irrationality. And, and when that happens, um, you know, then you could, you could get another dark age in the way that she sort of uh, imagines in this book. I mean, the illustration for as you know, going back to a dark age and rediscovering truth, um, is interesting psychologically. I think, you know, because we don't necessarily, when we go to self knowledge, we don't discover new truth nearly as much as we, you know, sort of rediscover, you know, our experience. If that makes sense, the way that Ayn Rand put it in Anthem was that all of the truth they were discovering was a rediscovering of truth. It wasn't a discovering of new truth. And if you compare that psychologically to self-knowledge, um, you know, it's, it's not things that we didn't know about ourselves or our history. It's things that we rediscover, you know, after they've been suppressed. So um, that's just what I was referring to with that second part. Does that make more sense? Yeah, okay. No, I totally get what you mean. Like, in other words, you know, you, you originally, for example, as a child, you kind of know you have a kind of direct connection with truth and then you get propagandized and then you rediscover it later on in, in a person's life. Is, is, is that sort of, that would be the, the individual case in the way that in her book, it's not like discovering new science, it's actually rediscovering truths after, after they'd all got, um, you know, sort of collectivized so heavily that they, that they lost that you know they're kind of lost track of technology and stuff yes and a really great aspect that just just popped in my mind a really great aspect of the metaphor was going underground you know that which yeah, is just yeah, that's true yeah yeah I, I i actually i just it just occurred to me i really appreciate that part of the metaphor that was really fantastic And what I found interesting in, in the book was um, how ideas weren't passed on in, in the kind of way that, um, say, we're passing on ideas um, here. Like, it wasn't like someone in a kind of in the in the next dorm down or whatever from this collectivist village was sort of passing books around again. Hey, these I've got these really great ideas, um, you know, about I and about about um, individualism and, and not collectivism. It was actually it was like the, the society had completely lost. Um, that concept it completely lost the ideas. They've been destroyed. But what were the, the remnants were the sort of the technology and the manuscripts that, that they found. I found that um, quite interesting. Yeah, I thought it was it was a little bit. It seemed it felt a little bit contrived that um, that he starts doing like electricity experiments down in in a um, in a, a subway tunnel. Like, but I mean. I just thought like, well, okay, yeah, let's go with it because I could see where she's, what she's trying to do. But it did seem a little bit like, you know, it was sort of like slightly pushing the plot a bit. Like, hmm, I wonder what happens if I, uh, you know, attach these wires. Oh, look at that. You know, <laughs> but because, because they're obviously at a stage where they're so kind of, um, they've got so primitive that the candles like a really big deal. 
and then he's down there making batteries and like, you know making electric circuits and that felt to me like a little bit of a a, a plot leap just as a just as in, in terms of like the yeah the kind of um the art side of the book but because she's obviously trying to make a philosophical statement a message but um the actually you know him him building a circuit down there and making making light so it sort, of, sort of seemed like a stretch to me but i thought it was a great book nonetheless well i I don't think that that's um, – I, I see what you're saying, Jake. I think that's entirely not surprising considering that it's Ayn Rand writing the book because um, there's no reference to parenting whatsoever. And Ayn Rand rarely ever makes reference to parenting um, in any of her books other than just like a few times in The Fountainhead and a few times in Atlas Shrugged. And the sort of like, oh, I suddenly discovered – electricity type of thing it's almost like it just pops into existence and that is almost like a theme in a lot of her her books and playing off of what um what steven said i mean uh, in regards to maybe the maybe the way that we will avoid as a species another regression is because what we're focusing on is you know the better parenting is the root cause of uh, spreading liberty, which is not really at all the root of what uh, I think Ayn Rand was trying to do. So, I mean, I, that's just sort of the more optimistic side of me coming out there, because I do see your point about it. Def there definitely could be another dark age, you know. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, she does make, she does make reference to, I, I know exactly what you mean, and of course she doesn't make reference to how parenting um, sort of led to these things in the book. I thought it was quite interesting that um, that she has a collectivist, well, kind of, sort of like non-parenting. That they basically it's like a sort of um, ultimate communist society, and that they have mating rooms, and they just decide like who's going to sleep with who, and then the the children are reared in um, in dormitories and so forth, and and so there is. Definitely a kind of um, like she's made she makes reference to the fact that these are obviously all completely love and nurturing deprived adult children in this in this dystopia. Right. They've all been basically raised in huge schools and had like zero um, individual care and attention um, paid to them. And so but but she doesn't explain how how he gets his own enlightenment in this, in this, I mean, I think James, your point is interesting that he goes down inside himself, so to speak, and the, and the, and the, um, the metaphor of going down into the, into the tunnel, I get, I think that's a really interesting insight. Um, but yeah, I get what you're saying, Phil, like that it's just sort of like, bing, light bulb goes on and you know, Howard Rourke is reborn uh, in, in the future with, um, with a hot blonde chick as well. Well, right. And I think that, um, it, I th after looking at a couple of interviews with Ayn Rand, I think it was, I don't know if it was the Mike Wallace interview or the Phil Donahue interview, but she, she was talking about being in school in Russia and like how she never had to work at what was going on in school. And like, so for her, it sounds like from when she was born, she just had this incredible brain, which is fantastic, you know, like, but it's accidental, you know what I mean? And it's almost like she took pride in that. And so, therefore, it's almost like, well, for me, everything, I just figured it out on my own. So that's how society is going to change, right? You know, as opposed to recognizing that it's got to be a multi-generational thing where we pass it on, uh, you know, pass on good ideas instead of it just sort of popping into existence sort of by random genes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm wondering, did anyone else find it confusing the use of the word "we" throughout the most the first part of the novella? Because I mean, I just kept thinking, you know, is this like a group of people that has the same name, or it didn't really even strike me that it was an individual until probably I'd say a third, you know, halfway maybe. Right, somewhere in that point that actually was, oh, this is probably just an individual, but it, it wasn't clear to me until he started using I, you know, and that all of these number designations were completely just 
you know, individual persons instead of like, co- you know, little, little mini collectives within the greater collective, if that makes sense. Or was I the only one who had trouble with that? <laughs> uh, th- throughout listening to the audiobook, I was continually, uh, I kind of had to um, reorient myself when I heard um, the we. I have to remind myself that it's no, it's just it's just one guy. So I mean, it sort of threw me off um, multiple times. But um, so just to <laughs> just to validate sort of your experience, I think that was sort of I, I got the sense that that was part of the idea as well. Was that because um, I had to? I certainly. I mean, I got I got that it was supposed to be one guy, but like you, Stephen, I had to keep sort of reminding myself of that because the language is so confusing but i think that's sort of the point isn't it that she like in in a sense it's quite clever because she's sort of saying showing how you know without individualism you're you just kind of lost in this fog of confused positive obligations to the herd you know and all of this you can't the guy keeps referring to himself as we um and you know you 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 sort of in a sense, you kind of get that confused zombie state from it because because of just because of the weirdness of the language, and so yeah, I'm, I found it totally confusing as well. But but it's sort of, it was that's why it was kind of like a huge relief. It was like when when finally when the guy starts saying I, it's like oh phew, now I can understand what the hell he's going on about, you know. Yeah. I- I knew enough about Rand to know when they when she said the forbidden word. I was like, oh, okay, it's going to be I or me or something like that. You know, I, I, <laughs> like I, oh, I figured I, I figured that much, but I did. I still couldn't quite. And actually, that that's probably a testament to how well it was written. That you know, it was it was thoroughly disorienting to think of uh, think of uh, an individual without an identity. You know, really, they they don't have identities at all, right? Um, except, of course, as, as was alluded to earlier, this guy magically has an identity, right? Or people have minor identities, but they're not really, like, fundamental. Like, this guy's is fundamental. Everyone else is just uh, sheeple going along with the herd. Yeah, except for his uh, lady. Uh, I yeah. think, um, for me, that was what was... Uh, sorry, James... No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's something else. Oh, I was just going to say that's for me, for me what was so um, kind of creepy about the book. Like I had a really kind of Orwellian creepiness type feeling throughout. Um, it's it's like everyone's going to grass you out. You know, it's real like slave on slave um, mentality is really is explored quite a bit in the book. Like there are these kind of sort of overlords and these, you know, the, the leaders and, and different um, kind of political classes and stuff. But mostly it's kind of like... Um, you know, when, when um, the, the main characters sort of start to d- discover this, you know, technology and sort of ask questions, it's mostly the people they're working with are really, um, you know, they, they say, oh, we're, we're going to tell the, the leaders or whatever, or, you know, this is, goes against all the laws and this kind of stuff. And um, so there's that, that great pressure from your, your peers, not so much from top, top down, if that makes sense. I find that quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was all like, you know, if you... It, it, you know that if you make a one false move, somebody's going to get re- somebody's going to report you. And he has that conversation with this with his one friend to, you know, about whether or not they're going to report it and whether or not they, the the other guy's going to um, report him. And uh, what, one thing I was going to say, if no one else has got any uh, any points just now, was um, I don't know whether Anthem was written before or after Atlas Shrugged. I, I assume before. Um, it, well, I think but, uh, it was before. Uh, during, I actually, I believe no, it was during. during. I think it was during the writing of the Fountainhead. Oh, okay. Um, it might have been. Yeah, yeah. I just know it was, it was, she took a break from one of her books. Um, yeah, she was. Yeah, as far yeah. as I get, she was doing Fountainhead, and it was just taking ages. So she she wrote wrote this um, on the side, and um, and Atlas was a bit later. Right, right. Because one of the thoughts I had was um, when as I was listening to it today for the second time on the audiobook was. Wow, this is kind of like, um, almost could be like a, a sequel to Atlas Shrugged, like a really small, condensed, short sequel. But it's also a great introduction to Ayn Rand's um, philosophy because it's very short, it's very compact. It's really all about the kind of the collectivist stuff. Um, 
it's it's kind of quite easy to follow. It's got a good story to it and so on, and it introduces some of the main ideas. I also thought it was almost like a fallout from the Atlas Shrugged type society because Atlas Shrugged is absolutely amazing work of genius, but actually it's it's like 90% kind of anarchistic or anarcho-capitalist, but then this huge dob of statism just thrown in at the end. Sorry, plot spoilers, too late. <laughs> um, and it's kind of like um, when, when I imagined the characters coming back from Gulch, Gulch at the end of um, Atlas Shrug, there was this real sense of, of hope, like the society's about to rebuild after a dark age, after the lights went out of New York and so on. And it's almost kind of like, wow, it could be really cool to imagine that like, Anthem is you know, a thousand years later or something after everything's just been burnt and scorched and cindered because um, the government's just, you know, taken root again and, and expand, you know, expanded and eaten up the, the economy and, um, and, uh, and it's sort of destroyed and, and set ablaze to everything. And it's kind of like, almost like starting again. Uh, and that was just something that popped into my head while reading Anthem. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's funny because it reminds me of... Um... I don't know if you guys have seen um, Cosmos, the uh, the Carl Sagan um, series, but he talks about um, basically, to cut a long story short, he talks about the fact that um, although it's highly uncertain, there's been so much time and there are so many planets and everything like suggests that there would be other, other that there would be life in the universe that in one one way of looking at it is that, you know, there should be, loads of intelligent life wandering around the universe sending radio signals you know sending probes going to check things out because they've had millions of years to do so um and why aren't they and um and or why can't we see evidence of it and one of the things like his uh, his hypothesis is because before civilizations get out into space they just self-destruct and start destroying each other and um in a way this is like I mean, he, obviously he wasn't coming at this from a, a, a voluntarist or anarchist perspective, but in a sense, you know, you could interpret that, in a, in a sense, like that is the case with status societies, that they do just self-destruct, and ultimately they could self-destruct really badly. And in a way, like this book is, you know, like you, like you say, Luke, it's like a, a, you, you, it could be like a sequel to... Um, to Atlas Shrugged after everything smashes up again and then this guy rediscovers um, a bit of individuality. And then what happens? Does he then, you know, have a bit of a renaissance and then a thousand years down the line it self-destructs again? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it actually at some point without a real principled um, philosophical grounding, it will just keep um, uh, self-destructing because that's what happens with statism always. It's only if you kind of make the jump to light speed and actually move into a voluntary society, a principled voluntary society, that that, that kind of um, boom bust of, of um, you know, building up technology and getting more enlightened and then having wars and smashing everything up and then building up again actually ever ends. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And um, I, I really noticed how um, uh, it sort of um, Ayn Rand paints collectivism is almost like this mind virus you know it doesn't just just keep everyone in order physically from the top down it's like it affects you like a, like a virus and i think um um you know so the way um uh, steph's described so many times in his videos and podcasts the the way that the government is basically a parasite that takes over the, the host society it's it's a virus um and it starts off as an idea and the idea spreads and the way you, you um you, you have to sort of immunize yourself against that. Otherwise, it's just going to take root again. And then until um, people actually have a, a principled stand and they have kind of like, I think in terms of universality to that kind of UPB, almost like a, um, a tool to stop that, that virus getting in, um, it's just going to um, happen again. Like we're, It's like these boom and bust cycles in the economy. It's like it gets really big, then it all kind of collapses again. And I, I don't think, I think um, there's always a, Progression. I think the stuff's always getting better, but I think we're we're doomed to kind of repeat the cycle. And Ayn Rand sort of paints it as collectivism as the the mind virus. Um, whereas I think because she didn't have UPB, she you know, she was still. Um, I don't know a lot about Ayn Rand, but um, I think you know she was still not a status, but you know there's kind of uh, a little bit of you know government and stuff in in her um, philosophy. So like the objectivist government, whatever that means. Um, so that kind of leaks out to society and then it, it, it just grows again and it takes over the, the host society again and kind of crashes and that cycle continues. Um, 
I just found a, a quite quite interesting, the, and that's why it made me think that Anthem could almost be like a, a very short sequel to Atlas Shrugged because she she left that uh, open in the end of Atlas Shrugged. You know, the with the with the judge, the guy that was the judge who was going to write all of the objectivist laws for society. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't read Atlas Shrugged yet, but I understand that at the end, it's like okay, now we're going to have another constitution. It's going to be better this time. So, which is like basically statism, Mark Two, the upgrade with objectivism. Oh, I, I just um, realised the juxtaposition of the beautiful modern house in the in the clearing in the forest, and what the kind of um, uh, just the the sheer difference between you know these people kind of get ejected from the society, which is barbaric and primitive, and then they kind of on a voyage of self discovery, and then they they're living in you know essentially like a uh, the wilderness, and then they they stumble across this amazing modern house, you know, and they're they're fascinated by the the mirrors because they'd never seen anything like that before, and all the clothes, and and then that's that what feels have kind of reminded me of of that, you know, it'd be like us thinking about a society in the future. Although in Anthem, it's kind of like a society from from the past, but it's it it looks futuristic, and especially with the being in the middle of this of the wilderness, you know, in, in under cobwebs and dust, it's. Underneath, it's this incredible modern palace. It's almost almost magical, um, you know. To uh, if, if they weren't, you know, rational kind of scientific types that Ayn Rand uh, portrays the main characters as, and they read the manuscripts and so on, they try to understand better the, the technology. But uh, I found just that popped into my mind. I thought that was actually really, really well done. The way that he, they they experience that place because they're walking in and they're saying like, you know. These rooms, you you could never fit more than seventeen people in these rooms, or something. You know, I can't remember the number, but you know, they're they're, they're totally different perspective um, coming from kind of their, you know, the time of their, their sort of like North Korea style. Everything's gone down to downhill, and everyone's li- living, you know, crammed into um, crammed into li- uh, you know, loads of people in a room, and they they go to this house and. Uh, and they kind of can't conceptualize how people would have lived in it at first. You know, they're trying to trying to work out like how many bedrooms that really, you know, what does that mean that there weren't there weren't more bedrooms and stuff? I think that house, by the way, um the way that she describes it is uh, I'm pretty sure that she's talking about um Falling Water, which is a Frank Lloyd Wright building, because I know that she was really like a huge fan of um Frank Lloyd Wright. He was apparently supposed to be one of the guys that she was thinking of for um, Howard Rourke in, in the Fountainhead, and just everything about the way that she describes that. If you if you if you look it up, this house in the woods that this modernist place with windows all the way around and stuff. It's basically, the, there is a real building that I'm pretty sure, in her mind, they just stumble across this Frank Lloyd Wright house. <laughs> the, the, the thing the thing that um, struck me the most in in the book, uh, the, probably the two scenes that at least emotionally moved me were the the really brutal kind of um, torture beating scenes. That was that was just like wow. That I remember when I first listened to that, just almost having to kind of fast forward to that point because it was so graphic. The the detail of the the whip hitting hitting um, uh, his back and 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 the agony of it, and, and then the kind of almost dissociating from um, from your body and and. Um, and the description of the pain and, and suffering that, that was just um, really, really almost like a tearjerker for me. That that scene, um, and how how um, the, the person was desperately holding on to to the idea of the light, like to protect the light. You know, they wanted to protect the idea, and that, um, that was very moving. And and the scene I think in, in the in the forest where they first sort of discover um, sort of uh, true love and the, between each other, and they're free from the, the pressure and the propaganda of society and they can experience each other um for the first time without their own self-delusion those are two scenes that really really touch me in, in the book yeah i i totally agree with you i mean i think especially the 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 latter one when they sort of escaped to freedom that was that was really um moving i think there is something a little bit creepy about the violence in um in iron rand's books um, cause obviously the, I mean, the only one I've, the only other one that I've read was, um, Fountainhead and that's got all of the bizarro rape stuff going on. Um, and I think she does kind of focus a bit on like her hero there is like, they're saying, where were you? And he's just like, um, 
he's he's just basically cutting out his feelings and he's not going to tell them anything or anything and I would be totally like, yeah, I was just down the road um, uh, bowing to the wonderful collectivist society that we live in. No worries, mate. You know, because I mean, this is just a horrible torture scene. And for her, the heroism is in kind of, uh, in a sense, like taking the lashes. And um, I don't know, there's definitely some, some weird stuff with her and violence uh, uh, that uh, just seems a bit strange to me. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a similar scene in, in Atlas Shrugged, with, um, but um, there's yeah, there's definitely some weird stuff going on there. I think, um, and also how it's kind of done. Like um, she often talks about how the how the pain is almost uh, pleasurable, um, because it's it's like you're if you, as long as you're feeling the pain and you, you sort of get, you know you're alive or something like that. Whereas I, you know I, I'm completely with you. I'll be like you know anything to escape the, the physical punishment. You know, yes sir, no no sir, whatever you want. You know give up the, the light, you know, anything for self-preservation. I found, I found that quite interesting because um, Ayn Rand being, you know, a staunch um, individualist and so on, and there was that scene where I was kind of conflicted about that, actually, you know, um, about, well, if, if your body is kind of uh, sacred, uh, not sacred, like in a religious sense, but if, it, you know, if it's, um, if it's, if it belongs to you and it's such an, it's just a crucial, you know, part of yourself being in touch with your body and your mind, because without, you know, your body, your mind can't function and Ayn Rand holding the mind so high and yet like allowing that like horrendous, um, horrendous beating just to preserve the, you know, couple of lights or whatever it was. I know it's kind of a huge thing in the context of society, but, um, I, well, I, I don't know, I was kind of conflicted or confused about that scene. I would have preserved the light, but I would have just lied and said, you know, Oh, I, w- I went for a walk. Um, I was just, you know, down the road or something. I mean, just like the the thing for him was like the honor, I think, of I'm not going to tell you. Where, But what honor is there in, you know, in, in basically getting beaten up by the by the state police? You know, I would have just given some bullshit story because they certainly don't deserve truth, those guys. So, um you know, it, it, even if he, even if as in the plot, he wanted to keep that, um, the light and that, um, that tunnel, because it was the one thing that really kept him going, which is totally understandable. He could have just bullshitted and, and given them any old crap story. Cause I mean, in a sense, they're, they're just government bureaucrats. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think she, as you say, like there's another part where somebody's getting burnt alive and there's, and she describes the guy like smiling and looking at him through the crowd, this previous individualist who gets burnt on the stake. And, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty weird, too, because, you know, he's getting burnt alive and he's smiling. And, um, and there definitely seems to be, for her, some sort of um, pleasure or honour in taking the pain um, as a symbol of your resistance to the, the regime when... You know, that just seems sort of a bit like kind of, yeah, just some, there's definitely some weird psychological subtext going on there with that stuff. I would take a lot of what, uh, you know, I, I would I would hazard to guess that a lot of their literal stuff in there, a lot of the stuff that is, you know, described in detail probably happened in one form or another. I don't I don't think there would be a lot of metaphor. I could be completely off. But I I mean, it could be that it was there was a lot of metaphor, but I think that there are some things that probably weren't. Like the whips, you know, um the the being being in, incarcerated in a room with a hundred other people. You know, with in a blank room with a hundred beds. You know, it was repeated several times in the book. You know the the <clears throat> the prison cell. The you know, even if it wasn't something that happened to her as an adult, I mean, I can imagine it being as a childhood. And also, it's interesting. You know, what's interesting about it? They just let her walk out of the prison. I was going to make the. I was sorry. I was going to make the exact same point. Yeah, the, the, there were the locks on the doors were just old and rusty, and and she could just walk out. Uh, sorry, the, the, or he, even the character, uh, could just walk out. And um, what it, it was described as, no one had ever even attempted that before because it was just everyone was so indoctrinated. You know, everyone believed that their own punishment was even for the good of the collective. That it was not even uh, fathomed the possibility that you could walk out 
uh, of, of the society. So even they wouldn't even attempt escape, let alone to, to burst through the door. And so that was that's a great point because that was another scene. I was like, what? You know, um, they just w- walked out of the door. They just broken in the lock and just walked out, you know, after being chained and whipped and beaten on this, on, you know, in this, in torture room. And, um, uh, what I, what I found interesting is the recurring themes about, um, like, like you said, the, you said the excellent metaphor earlier when, um, they went down into the cave to find, you know, enlightenment basically, you know, represented by the, by, by the flame, by electricity, whatever. And then they brought it to, um, the leaders, the elders, you know, almost like, they found that and wanting to help to change society, wanting to help change other people, but getting uh, completely rejected by that society. And of course, Ayn Rand throughout her whole life was rejected both, you know, for her, well, for her philosophy. And um, I don't know about her personal life much, but, and and also she had to uh, flee communist Russia. And of course, in in the book, she has to flee the collectivist society, you know, smash through a window, right. And, and, and run to the woods um, where she discovers this modern, you know, palace sort of thing, which, you know, I, obviously I, I saw parallels there with her having to, to escape communism and to flee to America, which is sort of her, her um, not, I wouldn't say dream world or dream idea, but obviously she, she had a, she loved New York and, and she was a staunch defender of capitalism and so on. So I found those, those analogies very interesting. Yeah, it's actually, I didn't, it hurt, didn't occur to me until you just said it, but yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, Direct analogy: the, the uncrossable forest, or the what was it? The unbreachable forest, something like that. Which you know, the, there no one can get through this unbreachable forest, and there's this shining, you know, glass. It's not glass. House, um, it, yeah, that she would have viewed that as America. Um, makes a lot of sense. I don't know if uh, any of you felt this when uh, you, you guys were brought in, bringing up the thing about the rusty locks that you could just walk right through. Um, but I totally made the connection to my family there. Like, oh, yeah, like, I'm not trapped here, right? But not realizing it, and then thinking how many people are just trapped in bad families and don't even realize they can walk right out. I don't know, I, I, I felt that when, uh, <laughs> when you guys were talking about that. It's been so long since I've read it that I forgot about that part. Yeah, totally. It's like you, you construct your own cage, right? Most most the, most of the cages in our lives are illusion. They're not they're not real. Yeah, and that was actually that was a kind of there's a lot of um, interesting stuff in in her having chosen to to do it like that because she could have obviously also had chosen all sorts of plot devices. So I think that is a really interesting choice because it does bring up a lot of. Um, potentially really, really powerful metaphors. I think there are some really brilliant flashes of metaphor regarding um, self-knowledge and personal growth. <clears throat> and then there are some really sad aspects to the, um, the, to, to the story where, you know, with the torture. And, and he, he, I even found, um, I actually was turned off by the description. And this is, you know, Rand grand depiction of women, of course, but I was turned off by, you know, the golden one, right? Um, her initial description. The thing that sticks out in my mind is, like, the colds, like, the coldness, the, the haughtiness, the, the throwing the throwing the seas at the ground and in disdain, that's the, that sort of description of her mannerism and behavior. Um, <clears throat> and, I mean, I, I, I get that, you know, grand treats treats women in her novels pretty badly um but you know I, that was i mean granted so it's not that's not like a blanket criticism of Rand or anything but just my own reaction to how she was introduced i just certainly wasn't been, wouldn't have been attractive to me you know? i thought the one the one thing that came to mind for me with that that relationship with the um with the you know the blonde chick is basically this is the the true individualists, right? And the, and the you know the golden one is also you know she's obviously escaped the city and come and found him in the woods and all this stuff. And then they get you know they they, they get to this house and they're going to be they're going to live as the true selves and everything. And he starts reading books and stuff. And then, and then he goes to her, you know, 
you know, we really need to have proper names. We should choose names for ourselves. I'm going to be called so-and-so and and your name is going to be this. (laughs) And he gives her a name and she's like, oh, all right then. Thanks. Yeah. And it's like, well, hang on. I mean, if this is individualism, wouldn't she get to choose her own name? Because it seems like basically, you know, he's saying we shouldn't be living with these names that others have given us. So, you know, I've chosen my own name. And by the way, his name I've chosen for you. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh, did did you catch the part where when they first get to the house, um, the, the the guy goes and does all the work, and he comes back to the woman, <laughs> and he's like, "But I couldn't get her to work because she kept staring at herself in the mirror." <laughs> it's like, what? Really? Oh. Wow. I mean, that that to me was like, wow. This is um. This, this is this is the individualist wife, I guess, her individualist mate. Wow. And I think um, Rand also has that tendency um, with a lot of her characters to um, make them into kind of heroes um, and heroines, and and also she kind of has this real fetish throughout her books for very tall Aryan types. Or is that just me, or is that not a recurring theme in her books? Yeah, especially tall Aryan women, right? I mean, because. She was obviously um, short and dark haired. And there is something going on there, which is that, uh, which is, uh, we talked about it a bit for, when we were looking at the fountain. It's a bit sad, really, but she's sort of got this shorthand for what a, um, you know, quality, virtuous woman would be. And she'd basically be somebody that Iron Rand doesn't get to be because uh, she'd be this tall, blonde you know, chiselled, angled uh, beauty. And there's definitely some some kind of sort of, you know, living out her own fantasy of her ideal physical self, I think, in there as well, that she's she's quite hung up on, um, you know, the, the physical beauty side of things. Right. And, I mean, I can kind of understand that from a standpoint of you know if your mind is beautiful right like if 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 you have a beautiful mind then you know that's kind of shows in the physical aspects but she makes that you know she does make that distinction right she she's you know she shows the beauty of his mind through all the first part of the book and then he catches a glimpse of himself in the water and he's like hey i'm pretty hot you know which is like (laughs) You know, there is that distinction. It's like, well, could we appreciate this person for his beautiful mind, you know, which is, you know, you know, fantastic, you know, in the book, the way it's preferred, without him being, you know, Mr. Universe. I'm not, not, not obviously not Mr. Universe, but to, to Rand, you know, this, this. But even more importantly for the woman, I think, because it's, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, because especially that's where the whole physical beauty thing um, is, you know, really in, in her books. Like, obviously, Howard Rourke is, um, he's like, obviously he's, he's supposed to look amazing and he's like this really handsome guy and everything, but he's also got this, um, he's got this strength of spirit and so forth. Whereas, um, oh, what's the name of the heroine in, um, Fountainhead, the crazy lady. I mean, her only virtue is basically that she's, she's really hot. And apart from that, she's like a total nutbag. Um, and you know, but but the 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 physical beauty is what attracts everyone to her, and what everyone thinks is so amazing about her. And in in this in this book in Anthem, you know, he uh, he does go on. The narrator does go on about basically how hot the the blonde woman is. You know? And I mean, I suppose she does also get to be. She gets to show some. Um, some virtues as well. I mean, she's brave. She escaped from the city and so forth. But, but it basically, I mean, he basically fancies her, doesn't he? I mean, it's, it's, they, don't, they don't really get to chat that much either, because because of all of the um, things that are going on. So it's not like um, it's not like um, Rand uses the, the book as a way of talking about the beauty of someone with virtue or a true self, as opposed to their physical self. She's definitely using the physical self as like a shorthand that basically if someone looks really good, then that's sort of, um, a, it goes hand in hand for Rand with being really virtuous. 
Right, which is interesting given that there are so many good-looking people out there which don't have a lick of virtue, you know, in the real yeah, world. Yeah, also, and also given the fact that Rand really was physically uh, not very hot. So, you know, what did that say about her and her own self-image? I didn't really get some... Um, I enjoyed reading this book, and it was... You know, was, I thought it was well written and interesting and so forth, but it wasn't really like a life changer for me in the sense that I didn't. There, there's nothing in there that is def, is going to sort of, you know, keep me pondering like how to like good stuff to, to really mull over or you know. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it feels like I read it and it was interesting and that's great, but um, I wondered whether or not you guys felt that there was. You know, I suppose maybe because it's not so personal, there's not necessarily something in there that you can really do stuff with. But what did you what did you feel about it? Well, uh, for me personally, it was um, I thought it was a, a really good read. I really enjoyed it, and I'd probably read it again. I think it's it sort of works as a good um, introductory type book to Ayn Rand's work, because certainly a, you know about you know collectivism and, and the dangers of that. Um, it didn't change me in the same way that um, Atlas shrugged. Or, or, you know, that, that just blew my mind. That was uh, an, an amazing book um, for me to read. Um, but it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty good. I um, would definitely, I think, uh, um, give that to someone. If they liked it, then maybe drop, uh, um, drop uh, Alex Shrug into them. I guess just one other thought I had was, um, I guess, related to sort of Anne Rand's treatment of, of female characters or the female character in this book in particular. Um, which was just how I, I felt like there was not enough treatment of her decision to leave the society and, you know, risk death to go look for um, her boyfriend in, in, in a forest where she could very easily have not found him or very easily have died. Um, it seemed like for her it was a bit, it was a choice, whereas for the guy he was sort of chased out as a result of sort of holding on to his his invention. Um, and so for her to make that choice, I think was a really big deal, but it was not sort of um, called out. I totally agree. I think that was a really, I mean, she's not, she doesn't really have a character um, in comparison because he goes through this whole process of self-discovery and then he makes inventions and he tries to go and reintegrate and he thinks he can convert the society and then he realizes he can't and then he goes off into the woods and she's like, well, my boyfriend's gone to the woods, so I'm going to the woods. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whereas, a virtuous say, penis. <laughs> whereas as you say for her it's actually a choice whereas he gets kind of run out of town and she's ma making she she doesn't she could have ca happily lived um uh within that society because they didn't know about her um but she risks everything and didn't you know, as you say I mean, this is a freaking forest so there's you know it was a little bit far-fetched that she she finds him on like day one she just walks into the forest he's like oh there yeah. you are um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's a chance. There's a whole self-freeing um, story for her that Iron Man just sort of passes by. Does you know? She just happens to hook up with uh, you know Mr. Virtue. But yeah, and no, I thought that was a really good point, Stephen. Yeah, I agree. She just kind of like tags along like a little puppy, and it's like, where's her <laughs> and virtue? And then goes and stares in the mirror all day long. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's interesting and maybe that is also a comment on sort of Anne Rand's view like she has a good conception of independence and individuality but very poor concept of um, sort of a relationship between two strong peers absolutely yeah I think that's absolutely right and that probably reflects the kind of relationship that she had with her husband as well right because right. You know, she was basically the she was the trousers of the outfit, and he was kind of like the support staff, as far as I understand. Mm. Awesome. Well, I mean, I'm I'm probably going to um, uh, leave now, just because this connection is a, no doubt about to uh, 
to go again. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed chatting about this book, and I enjoyed reading it too. Um, what, did you guys? How did you enjoy the call? What did you? What did you think? This was good. This is enjoyable. I really enjoyed it too. I'm so sorry for giving away so many plot spoilers about the shrugs. <laughs> and, and I had another point to make about it at the end, but I thought, no, you know, I want to leave a little bit for um, other people to enjoy when they read it. So, um, but you, I definitely think um, uh, you're going to notice some similarities for those of you who haven't, haven't read it and, and to, to add them, but like in a more grand, massive, epic kind of fashion. But uh, I, I enjoyed the book and I enjoyed the call. So thanks very much to everyone. Fantastic. Well, it's just such a pleasure to um, to be able to talk about these kind of ideas with people who are interested in them. I'm, I'm, it really makes me happy, and I'm, I always look forward to it. So, thank you so much, everyone, for coming along. It's just just a really a real pleasure for me. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, thanks, guys. I enjoyed the chat too. Awesome. Have a great weekend, and uh, look forward to talking to you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.